Welcome to this next video on balances as guides towards a sustainable future. Well, after we have seen all the resources, how we use them up, how they are then finally burned and released into the atmosphere, the next question we want to answer today is how about the atmosphere? How does atmosphere, carbon dioxide, influence the climate? Well, of course, we want to again set up a balance and we want to again, again balance a global system, the global atmosphere this time. Now, if you look at this balance, it looks like this. We see here the region of the atmosphere. It's only this layer, so to speak, of some kilometers surrounding our globe. And obviously we are releasing the fossil resources by burning them where we first extract them and then burn them and release the CO2 in the atmosphere. The question is, what happens at the atmosphere? Of course, you want to systematically set up the appropriate balance. How does that look like? Well, first of all, we write on the left-hand side of the equal sign, we write the change within the balance volume. This is the change within the atmosphere. And that is well, on the one hand side, what is entering? Entering is what we mine, what we burn. This is almost identical, small, different, uh, small changes between these two values, but we can use the, uh, them identically for this purpose. On the other hand side, what is leaving? Now, this is complicated. We will see in just a moment that actually there are significant contributions of CO2 leaving the atmosphere but they are very hard to describe. On the one hand side, for example, all the plants are using the CO2 to build up their leaves and their biological matter. The oceans are taking up the CO2. But on the other hand side, both are also releasing large quantities of CO2 under different circumstances. So it's a well, entering and leaving uh, streams to ocean and to plant material, for example. So what is leaving is hard to describe and actually, as I mentioned, there are additional streams of CO2 entering the atmosphere that have been taken up by the ocean or by the plant material before. So it is difficult to describe what in the end will be winding up in the atmosphere, what is really entering, what is the net stream entering the atmosphere. Well, then there are two other contributions we would have to take into account what is occurring, what is produced, and what is disappearing. Well, of course, there are some chemical reactions, especially under sunlight, that may take place where actually CO2 may be destroyed or CO2 may be, react may be reacting to something else. But actually, this, compared to all the other things, these amounts are extremely small. So we want to neglect them for this moment. Up with some CO2 being released into the atmosphere because we are mining the fossil resources and burning them and releasing the CO2 in the atmosphere. How much that is, we actually know. And we don't know all the other things. But what we can assume for a moment is that the leaving things and all those things are more or less fractions of what we have been burning. So what we say is, the remainder of what is then released into the atmosphere is some factor alpha of that what we have burning. So if we mine something and burn it, we can say how much CO2 this really re releases into the atmosphere. And then we say, as good engineers, so to speak, there are some pre-factor to that, which accounts for the fact that something may be taken up by the, by the oceans, something may be taken up by the, by the plants, and uh, so only a certain fraction is then in the end winding up in the atmosphere of that what we have been burning before. Okay, now we should argue a little bit what this factor should be. It should be presumably, according to what I've just said, something between zero and unity, between zero and one. Somewhere in between that range that alpha should be. We actually don't know where it should lie, but we can think a little bit about that. We can, for example, have a look at the contributions to the CO2 emissions, globally speaking. And there we see that, of course, again specified by the sectors, a significant amount of CO2 is released as energy-based, uh, or come stemming from energy-based uh, contributions. 
meaning buildings, heating, cooling, transportation, power generation, industry and other energy related. Roughly two thirds of all of the CO2 emissions are coming from energy related causes. On the other hand, there are certain causes that release CO2 in the atmosphere or greenhouse gases as a whole. This is change of land use, yeah, deforestation leading to uh, release of CO2 in the atmosphere, agriculture by itself releases for example methanes, yeah, cows are rela releasing methane and that's a greenhouse gas, you can, you can account for that as a CO2 equivalent and waste that is for example decaying is also a fraction here contributing to the CO2 con uh, emissions. So one third of the CO2 emissions are non-energy related. This means if you account how, for how much fossil energy carriers we are burning and uh, taking that into account, calculating the CO2 amount of that, then actually we find that there is more CO2 possibly being released. So actually the factor alpha is not just between zero and, one, uh, and, and unity, but it actually can be beyond that because there are other CO2 releases into the atmosphere which are not, not coming from the fossil resources. So this shows it can be up to a factor of 1.5 actually. Yeah? Energy related emissions taken as unity, that's what we describe based on the mining, releasing that as CO2 in the atmosphere, and then half of that can then non, is the non-energy related emissions of CO2, of greenhouse gases. So that could actually be another half of that, meaning 1.5 on the whole, if you take this as a reference. This is one aspect. The second aspect is that there are large carbon dioxide, or actually one says carbon uh, streams, globally speaking. This is total, to all this together uh, constitutes the so called carbon cycle. The carbon cycle is shown here. Actually, the lettering is pretty small, but I will explain some of the major aspects of this carbon cycle. The numbers are actually in gigatons of carbon per year. Gigatons, we learned already, is 10 to the 9th of tons, a huge amount per year. And the, uh, the numbers in brackets, which are given, given here, are gig gigatons. The, there's the, the globe is, or the system of the Earth is, so to speak, uh, separated in different, as one calls them, compartments. One, for example, is the ocean, the bi biosphere, the atmosphere, the land material, or the, the lithosphere, as we have called that. And they are uh, characterized by the gigatons of carbon that are stored in these compartments. And now the flows, the streams or fluxes of, the, of carbon are quite gigantic. And I would just tell a little bit about the numbers. For example, 120 gigatons per year are taken up by plant material. The plant then Res, uh, they have a process respiration during nighttime when no sunlight is shining, which is again 60. And on the other hand side, these plants are releasing also some carbon to the soil. And here, microbial res repris, respiration and decomposition of plant material releases another 60 gigatons per year. So 120 coming in, 60 and another 60 more or less leaving. So overall, it's zero. There's no net consumption, no net uptake or no net release of carbon in this carbon cycle between plant, soil and the, the release by respiration um, either from the plants or the from the microbes. Then between the oceans and the atmosphere similarly large flow rates they occur. 90 gigatons per year are taken up by the ocean and 90 are then released again different conditions, different temperatures and different uh, yeah, situations at the ocean. And the ocean actually has to be separated into two main regions, may, two main compartments. It's the uh, surface layer of the ocean and the deep ocean layer, uh, which is actually the, a very, very large compartment, which accumulates lots of CO2 of carbon in the end. And here we see again 90 coming in and 90 leaving, which means net uptake is zero. So if we would leave this system alone, we would have 120 photosynthesis, 
plant respiration 60, decomposition microbial respiration another 60, so this is zero and this is zero as well. So you would have a stable system, the carbon dioxide concentration globally speaking would be more or less constant in the, in the atmosphere, actually in either of the compartments, in each of the compartments. And now in red we see additional contributions due to our human activities, which is on the one hand side the fossil fuels leading to 9 gigatons of carbon per year released additionally into the atmosphere by fossil fuels, by cement produ production and by land use change. Of those, then certain, well, they, they wind up at different locations, so to speak, and these are only estimates one should clearly say. Three are additionally taken up by photosynthesis. Another two are taken up by the atmosphere, so that uh, four of them are remaining in the atmosphere. So there's an excess of four actually winding up in the atmosphere. So of the nine released on the whole, four are winding up in the atmosphere, which means four ninth of the 1.5 that we have mentioned before, times the fossil energy carriers, would be winding up in the uh, atmosphere. So alpha should be larger, at least larger than 0.44. Uh, if we only account actually for the fossil fuels, it would be 4 ninth of the fossil fuels, which would then be 0.44. These four of these nine winding up in the atmosphere. So this alpha should at least be 0.44, even a little bit larger possibly. This is one aspect. Secondly, we can now look at how the historical behavior of the system actually looks like. We look at the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, and I have this explained this already in the introductory uh, video, that we see that the annual going up and down of the CO2 concentration, which is due to the fact that photosynthesis takes place everywhere, and especially uh, the uptake, that is the reduction of the atmospheric CO2, meaning the CO2 being well, converted to biomass to, to plant material, especially in uh, spring and summer, whereas in winter uh, the uh, plant material, the leaves are falling from the trees, they are decomposing and the CO2 is then again released into the atmosphere. Actually, if th there would be an equal amount of plants in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, when there is summer in the one hemisphere, there is winter in the other, so what is taken up here would be released on the other side and the other way around. Thus, actually, if that would be the case, the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere would be more or less constant throughout the year. But actually what we see is that there are more, that there's more fertile land area in the North Hemisphere, in the Northern Hemisphere, meaning actually the uptake and the release of CO2 on the Northern Hemisphere is much larger as compared to the Southern Hemisphere. So actually what we see here is the dominance of the northern hemisphere in the uptake and the release of the CO2 by plant material. This is the going up and down that we see here annually. Now if we average this out, this for uh, take a um, uh, moving average for one year across the data, across the originally monthly data, we see that uh, the CO2 concentration is continually increasing. And of course this has to be because as we learned before, we are mining fossil energy carriers, we are burning them and then releasing them into the atmosphere. Now the question is, can we do something with that? Can't we use to fit these historical data by a suitable model and by that describe or determine the alpha parameter? And that's exactly what I have done. I took these data, plotted I curved through that, I calculated or I took the original data for the natural gas, for crude oil and coal uh, mining that can be converted to the CO2 production if all this is burned. And then one can relate that to the CO2 concentration change in the atmosphere. And then one can fit this coefficient alpha in front of the, this balance, so to speak, and can then look how that should be so that we fit the historical data with this accuracy. And we wind up with an alpha of 0.55. So 55% of the fossil energy carriers annually produced are or mined and then burned are then released as CO2 in the atmosphere. So that's the behavior of the past and we see how that actually extrapolates then into the future. 
So because this is looks so nice in the past, we believe that this also also holds for the future. And actually for the future data, data I have taken those values I have determined in the last video, where the effects of increasing world population and increasing standard of living and by that induce an increase per capita consumption of fossil energy carriers, all that is included. And this, this then leads to this increase of the future CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Well, actually, of course, this is a rather crude assumption that we have made, that we can take a sim single parameter in front of the CO2 release, the annual CO2 release, in order to describe that. I will dwell on that a little bit more in the next, on the next slide. But let's first look at the result. Here we see that the pre-industrial value of 280 ppm by volume is down here. We see how that is increasing to the la during the last roughly 50 years, how strongly this has been increasing. And we, it looks like an exponential increase, so very dramatic increase actually. And here is plotted this plus 2 degree centigrade limit if we evaluate uh, the data from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change where they say on the average that we would reach this plus 2 degree centigrade limit. I will dwell on that in, in the next minutes as well, but let's take that value as given, so to speak. Now the question is, can we somehow manage not to cross this line, because at that line significant climate changes are expected that may be irreversible. The climatologists say up to that limit, up to the plus 2 degree centigrade limit, everything should be more or less reversible. For example, in Antarctica, the ice shields can uh, melt completely, meaning that the reflection of the sunlight from this ice uh, shield is reduced, which would then increase the temperature of the globe. So this is apparently a rather um, irreversible process, because on that warmer surface, no ice will form within the next decades or so then. So that's an irrevers irreversible shift towards a warmer planet. And they say up to the plus 2 degrees centigrade, they believe that something, something like that should not happen. There are other irreversible things that can happen. Changes in the overall uh, ocean uh, streams that we have, the, the, the Gulf Stream, if that may, uh, might be stopped under certain conditions. And they say up to plus 2 degrees centigrade, that does not happen. So the question is, can we somehow prevent crossing that red line? And actually looking at this curve as an engineer, I see, well, it's exponential growth. I don't see why that should not be crossed. Yeah? If we continue as we did for the next, 50, uh, next 10 years or so, we will simply cross that red line without any problem. So if anything has to happen that prevents us from crossing that line, that ha really has to have happen within the next 10 years. After that, we have crossed that line and that's it. Well, actually, one has to be a little bit careful about such a statement because the globe, the entire Earth, is a big system. Big systems sometimes are reacting a little bit slowly. So there is a chance that actually, even if you are higher with the concentration, but get it down quickly enough, that then overall the temperature will increase a little bit, but not significantly beyond the 2 degree centigrade limit. Okay. Well, I should say there are correlations that show or more, much more detailed simulation that have been performed that show that if we stop using fossil resources in the, to the extent that we are doing it today but using sustainable energy, renewable energies in the future and push that technology significantly, actually we have the technology, it's only too expensive today, if we use it nevertheless, pay that price so to speak, we are able to really um, solve the problem of not crossing this red line. On the other hand side, let's take it that we cross it and take again a pr uh, projection until the uh, to year 2050, then we would I wind up in 2050 with 530 ppm by volume. And I will just show in a second or three, uh, three slides later where this what that really means. Now, if you are a little bit um, questioning what I am telling you, you may question one very significant thing, of course, because, as I said, the orange line here 
stems from calculating how much CO2 has been released annually and the increase here directly corresponds to the increase in the atmosphere. This is of course not true because as we have seen the, uh, the CO2 will release it into the atmosphere but actually we, have to, we would have to account for the fact that a certain amount is then taken up by the oceans, by the plants and so on. So just taking the fossil energy carriers and saying this, the, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere depends on that, that's sort of vague. But one, one, should, one should stress one thing, which is a little bit tricky actually. If we look at two things, on the one hand side on the CO2 emissions in gigatons per year, and on the other hand side look at the accu accumulated CO2 emissions, everything that has ever been released without accounting for the fact that a certain fraction of that is taken up by the plant material, by the oceans and so on, the curves actually look very similar. Yeah? Of course the momentary emissions, they show a certain scatter, they go, go up and down depending on the economic situation, whereas the accumulation is a much more smoother curve, so we, but nevertheless we can say they show a very similar behavior. So if you scale them properly, you are able to, dis to use either of these curves for the description of the overall behavior. Well, for those who are mathematically a little bit more um, well familiar with mathematics, if this is an exponential behavior, then of course integrating the exponential will wind up with an exponential again. So the principal behavior of some exponential curve and the integrated, the accumulated exponential curve, the principal behavior is identical. So we can take either the momentary release of the CO2 or we can take the accumulated CO2 over the decades, we will get the identical results. Well, now we want to look at the predictions or actually also projections of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they have um, started or induced a certain number of climate uh, projections uh, where, it should, where the question was how does the temperature increase as the greenhouse gas concentration is increasing. It's assumed that we are talking about stabilization level, meaning it's a constant value and not a dynamic system. Well, of course, the system itself, the, the weather system is dynamic, but the overall situation of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is constant. And also we are looking at the equilibrium global mean temperature. That is that temperature, temperature that is, released, is reached after we wait a certain number of years. And we see that, well, today we are actually somewhere almost here at 400, 400 ppm, and this corresponds well, to a range of temperatures above pre-industrial, the zero here is in pre-industrial value of something of the order of uh, around one to one and a half, perhaps even two de beyond two degrees. I can plot that. The today's level, actually, this is a CO2 level, and actually we find today that the temperature is increased above pre-industrial value by 0.75 degrees centigrade, roughly. Uh, it's of course only a certain estimate because measuring the temperature of an object as big as the Earth is not a trivial task, apparently. So this is also only just a certain estimate of that. We see that we are below this range that is specified by IPCC. And one should stress that IPCC has just collected results from different studies and they did not weight them according to their probability because Simply, we don't know which model is the best, so we only see that a certain range is um, covered by the models that are used for the simulation today. So there is a certain probability that the results, it's a real behavior, will lie somewhere in this range indicated by the different models. So if we nevertheless stick with the black line, for example, which is sort of the intermediate value between the, model the different model simulations, we would actually wind up at an equilibrium temperature of 1.5 degrees centigrade. 
If that were true, that would just mean that we are not yet in equilibrium. We have to wait another year, some years, perhaps decades, until we reach that black line. So even if we keep the CO2 level at the value we have today, temperature may still increase. The plus 2 degrees centigrade level is shown here. Stabilization value again, meaning constant conditions for an extended period of time. And we see that the plus 2 degrees centigrade, again taking the black line, which is not the most probable, but just the intermediate of the scenarios that are possible, we would wind up at 430 ppm of, uh, of greenhouse gas concentrations, CO2 equivalent. I've mentioned that already in the introductory se section. Other greenhouse gases calculated as if there were CO2, so CO2 equivalents. Now, in the calculation before, the projection before, we saw that we could reach up to 530 ppm by volume in 2050 if we would continue emitting CO2 as we did in the past and continue actually also the way we developed in the past. Then we would wind up with a temperature increase beyond the industrial level by plus 3 degrees, roughly speaking. Again, I should mention, this is the range and somewhere in between IPCC assumes that we should wind up in the end. Now that the temperature is increasing, we see from the fact that glaciers worldwide are retreating. Some glaciers are actually not, but this is always the case because, well, if, even if everything, the temperature of the overall system increases, uh, the climate regions shift a little bit meaning that the clouds are, bet are formed here, it's getting a little bit colder here, but it's getting warmer on some other region. And that's actually happening also with some of the glaciers. Some are in locations where the temperature is decreasing, but overall the temperature is increasing and the glaciers are retreating. So this is a more or less general phenomenon, globally speaking. So all this indicates that more or less we have understood the system. We now how, know how it behaves. Yeah, we know how the temperature increase as a, increases as a function of greenhouse gas concentration. Everything is fine. Now with the next few slides, I would like to question that. And uh, I would like to question that also based on discussions that occur in the internet where, or in, in some movies that have been presented in the past. And I would just show how little we may possibly know about this system. I should directly stress I'm not a climatologist, I'm just an engineer, a chemical engineer. But I take those data that are available and try to compare them. As an engineer, I've pointed that out, I would like to have a complete picture of what's going on. And that should not contain contradictions. And I would just mention some things where I have the impression that there are still contradictions present in the current discussions. Now the first thing that is also frequently presented if we look at climate change and CO2 are these data from ice cores. They come from Antarctica, so the holes are drilled into the ice core, samples are taken during drilling and then it's evaluated uh, how much CO2 is in the different layers and the layers are uh, well attributed to different times and the times date back from today, actually the year 2000, over here, you can directly see it, up to the year minus 400,000 and something. So we look back quite far in the, into the past. And so the samples are taken from the different height layers of these ice cores, evaluated how much CO2 is contained in there. This is one thing. And secondly, by certain shifts of specific species within the um, ice, uh, in the, these ice samples, one can also deduce the temperature. Actually, this temperature correlation is a tricky thing, but people will believe that it's uh, accurate. So, what we see here is that we have warmer periods and colder periods, ice age and warm periods in between, ice age, warmer period in between, also here a slightly warmer period, and we see how temperatures have been going up and down in the past. And that somehow correlates always with the CO2. CO2 is high as the temperature is high, CO2 is low as the temperature is low. And here again, CO2 high, temperature high, CO2 low, temperature low. Currently, we are actually in a region where temperature is high and CO2 is high. 
actually it's increasing beyond these bounds. We also see that in the past the CO2 concentrations of 300 ppm have been reached. As mentioned, we are now 100 ppm above that, some, something over here. Can you see that on the video? I doubt that. Yeah, somewhere over here we are with the CO2 level today. So beyond the, all the historical values, we left that range that, we, that the Earth has seen in the past. So because we see this is uh, hot, this is hot where the CO2 level is high, well, warmer as a CO2 level is high, we believe that, that there is a certain correlation. That's one indication why CO2 and temperature are believed to somehow correlate. But strangely enough, if we look at the details, we see now that we have here 700 ppm by volume from this highest level of 270 ppm. Well, it's actually a little bit above. I took some average value here, some average value there as well, some average value here and there as well. And then we see that, these seven, that this shift between high and low levels is of the order of 70 ppm and the temperature shift from here to there corresponds to roughly 7 degrees centigrade. So we can say 1 degree centigrade per 10 ppm by volume. So 70 ppm then results in 7 degrees centigrade. Now if you plot such a line in the IPCC diagram, it looks like that. This is the line 1 degree centigrade per 10 ppm by volume. The behavior is much steeper than predicted by the IPCC, by the climate models in the IPCC. I find this strange actually, significantly strange. This is one thing. Uh, a second thing that is discussed uh, in certain, uh, uh, well, on the internet and also in certain um, uh, movies, you, is, uh, this is a so-called global dimming. People have realized that if you look at the solar, uh, the incoming solar radiation on the ground of Earth, uh, that that has decreased during the last years. Actually, in some regions it has been decreasing by 10% and almost 20% in some regions. But overall, people believe that the reduction of the solar radiation is of the order of 4%. Now the question is, of course, what does that mean? concerning temperature. What does it mean if the incoming sunlight is reduced by 4%? We have seen in the balancing video that actually the temperature of the Earth depends on the balance of radiation of the incoming sunlight and the radiation of Earth itself into the universe. And what does it mean if the incoming sunlight is decreased by 4%? Now you can simply apply the balance I have shown there and can solve it and what you see is actually this blue line. As, well, zero of course means no change with respect to re solar radiation and no change in temperature, so that's the state of the Earth if all the radiation is, in, is coming in and uh, of course then no temperature cha change occurs. But if you reduce the incoming the radiation, the temperature will de decrease and at roughly 4% of reduced radiation, the temperature will be decreased by minus 3 degrees centigrade. This blue line, again, stems directly from solving the balance. So this is a more or less accurate calculation. Well, so here we see that actually due to this global dimming, it is to expect it that, that the global temperature will decrease by 3 degrees centigrade. Strange. We don't account for that in the climate predictions. Why not? Something else is strange. If you look at an argument frequently given for this climate change is that you look at the temperature on the one hand side, the temperature as it has been observed during the last 50 years roughly, and look at the CO2 concentration in ppm by volume, the temperature being the red curve, the CO2 concentration, the annual average being the black circles, you see that they correspond nicely to each other. So this appears to show that temperature directly follows the CO2 concentration. Of course, it's a little bit question of scaling, but that looks very nice. Now you see I've posited here some different y-axis. What is that for? Well, actually that is for passenger mileage in billion kilometers per year. These are the blue dots. The blue dots follow the, the same behavior again. 
So also the passenger mileage, mileage behaves identical to the CO2 emissions, behaves identical as compared to the temperature increase. What does that mean? By comparing the black circles and the blue dot, you can just say, well, human activities, globally speaking, have been increasing in a certain way, and that the way is described by such a general behavior, more or less slightly exponential increase. That's what we have been observing during the past. So CO2 is rising, passenger mileage is increasing, and many other activities have been increasing in a similar fashion in the past. Of course, I didn't choose passenger mileage just randomly. Um, I, I, took it, I took that value because, of course, the condensation trails of the planes form clouds. Clouds increase the reflection of the Earth, as the more sunlight is being reflected. That means, in the end, if you look at the balance, the temperature of the Earth is being decreased. So we have here another effect. Increasing passenger mileage means Increasing clouds means decreasing temperature. So we have here another effect not taken into account, which means the temperature is decreasing. And the problem now is all these things are behaving in a very similar fa fashion, and the effect, meaning the temperature increase, also behaves in a similar fashion. And what is the trick about that? Well, the trick is if you have different effects that shift the temperature in one or the other direction, CO2 increasing temperature, global dimming decreasing the temperature, passenger mileage decreasing the temperature. You don't know what the individual contributions are because all of them in the end will wind up in a curve something like this red curve independently how strong these different effects actually are. Just to explain that for example the CO2 increase may lead to a temperature increase of say plus 7 degrees centigrade. We just saw that the global dimming decreases possibly the uh, temperature by minus or by three degrees, so minus three degrees. Let's assume that the passenger mileage also decreases the temperature by three degrees. So we have plus seven, minus three, minus three, one degree remaining. And since all these things behave in a similar way, you will see that along the entire way during time. And then you wind up with this plus one degrees centigrade here that you observe experimentally between here and there, which is 0.8 or so degrees in between there, and that corresponds nicely what you have predicted. And that you cannot really discriminate the individual effects. This could also be pl plus 10 degrees, and the other one minus four and minus five degrees or so. You will still wind up. Since you cannot determine the individual contributions in such a complex system, you cannot really attribute the effect to one or the other cause. The causal relation cannot be really drawn in such a complex system. That means we know very little. We are running a very big climate experiment on our globe. With that, let me summarize what I have discussed. I have shown that the CO2 in the atmosphere and the plus two degrees centigrade limit are critical. And I have shown that we have roughly 10 years time of the order of 10 years, say 10 to 20 years time, to really solve the CO2 problem for the atmosphere because otherwise we don't know if we don't cross this plus two degree centigrade limit. I've shown you the problems with global dimming and the passenger mileage and all this I only have shown to uh, perhaps make a little bit clear that the overall system has been little understood we still have a significant amount of ignorance on the interactions of this overall system. So with that I would like to finish this discussion on atmosphere, carbon dioxide and climate and next time we will then start looking into land area, bioenergy, nutrition and possible ways to solve the problem by using sustainable energy supply. And I would be happy if you, you would join me for these next chapters. Thank you very much. <music>